Well, good morning, Fellowship Greenville. It is so good to be back. I'm very glad to be back home after a uh, magical missionary tour. Uh, Karen and I were on with some friends. Uh, we were able to visit uh, Franz Martin. Some of you might know him. He's in Berlin at Fellowship Potsdam, helping plant that church there. Uh, a guy named Chad Gefeller, who is uh, a, a, an evangelistic refugee soccer ministry and also serves at a church there in Berlin, too, there. Went down to Munich, visited with Stephen Mueller and his family, who's planting a church, or has planted a church in Munich. Then we went over to Bordeaux and visited with Eddie and Christy Sylvie, uh, and they've been missionaries with us for 33 years, so it was a really great time being with all of those people. And uh, then we were back four days, got on a bus with a bunch of senior adults, which I am one, okay, all right, just don't rub it in, but I am one, and we went to the Bible Museum in Washington, D.C., and Amish country, and then to the Sight and Sound Theater up there, which is absolutely amazing to see Moses, uh, the production of Moses, and we're gonna go again next year, so if you didn't get a chance to go this year, sign up for next year. Anyway, I wanna continue to encourage you to be praying about war-torn countries like Israel and the Ukraine, uh, Jesus called us to be peacemakers, which that means that we should be peace prayers and praying for the peace of Jerusalem. And by the way, just so you know, um, when events in our world, uh, tragic events like this happen, tragic circumstances, when we hear about that kind of thing, your missional impact team uh, moves into action. And the way that we normally work is like this. We look for a partner, a mission partner, or a local church in the area where the devastation is occurring, and we want to help fund them be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus in that area. We don't just send money indiscriminately to all kinds of different places. We look for partners that we can help them be Jesus to the people that need that humanitarian aid. And because of your generous giving, to missional impact, we're able to be very generous in, in how we're able to come alongside and help. So thank you for your generosity about that. Now, I'm so glad you've chosen to worship with us today. Um, God is doing great things in us and among us and through us, and we're glad that you're here. And let me just say a special welcome. If, if this is your first time uh, here at Fellowship Greenville, we want you to know, and you have come at a, a, a defining moment for us. And the next several Sundays are gonna be a bit different from our usual Sunday morning teaching. And because if you attend here on a regular basis, what you'll find is we'll normally be uh, teaching our way through whole books of the Bible or long sections of scripture. And we just finished up um, a series working our way through the first three chapters of the book of Revelation series title was Seven, What the Spirit is Saying to the Churches. And one of the most important things we learned in that series was that Jesus, both then and now, is actively present in the midst of his local churches. And he's speaking to them. He speaks words of encouragement and correction to his church, churches. He is up close and personal with each and every local church. And we saw that he knows the strengths and weaknesses of his churches. He knows the spiritual condition of the hearts of the people in his churches. He knows the opportunities and the missed opportunities set before his churches. And because of the opportunity that God has set before us, we are transitioning from what the Spirit is saying to the churches to what the Spirit is saying to us, what the Spirit is saying to us in this season in the life of our church. Now, if you've been attending here on a regular basis for the last year or so, you know we've talked uh, quite a bit about how God has graced us with growth. At a time when 85% of the churches in this country are in decline, at a time when about 4,500 churches a year are closing their doors, God has seen fit to bless us with new people coming each week. In fact, there are over 1,000 new people here now this year than there were at this time last year. And that's, if you take into uh, to account the last two years of growth, we've experienced about 33% growth in the last two years. We just had a new members class with 180 people go through it. And now, hear me. Um, 
we're not about numbers, never have been about numbers for numbers sake, but the fact is, numbers are people, single people, families, children, students, adults, senior adults. Numbers are people, people that God keeps bringing to us so that they can come to know Christ and then grow up into Christ, like a teenager named Daniel who said he was raised in the Christian home and at age 14 he got baptized to check it off his list, but after three years uh, being in our student ministry here, he, he realized that he could never gain Christ's love uh, through his good works, and he says that Fellowship Greenville's helped him more fully understand God's grace and how to grow to be more like Jesus. Uh, and uh, out of love for him and not out of, out, of, out of duty. Or Michelle, who was raised in a Catholic church, and she believed in Jesus for as long as she could remember. But through the ministry of our church, she came to understand that through Jesus' death and resurrection, the new life that Jesus offers comes as a free gift and not something that you have to earn or work for. Or Caroline, who was raised in a Christian family her whole life, but recently she said that God had spoke to her into her life through a relational hardship that she was going through, and so uh, she sensed that God was calling her to follow him with all her heart, and she had moved here from another state and, and got involved with a small group of women, and, and she basically just said, I want to dedicate everything I am and everything uh, I have to Jesus. Or a couple, both of whom were raised in very rule-oriented, strict churches. And they always felt like, though, that something was missing. And the very first time that they visited here, they had this aha moment, in their words. And, and they came to see that salvation is by Christ alone through faith alone. It's not dependent on works. And they trusted Christ for forgiveness and new life. And this just happened uh, in the last uh, 10 days to two weeks. A man named Craig, who is a Jew, an older man, he started coming to a class on Tuesday night, a Bible study taught by Stephen Boyce. He's been coming for about a year, and just last week he trusted Christ as a Savior. He, he, he gets this, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, after a year of evaluating Jesus of Nazareth, I had no choice but to see him as the Messiah. The evidence is undeniable. Now, I could go on and on. Uh, that's God's amazing grace at work in people's lives, and we see evidence of it every week. And the result of, of that growth is that we're just about out of space. I mean, for the most part, both audi auditoriums, both hours are full. And as Jason said in the video, uh, we, many weeks we have to turn kids away from fellowship kids. Um, either we don't have volunteers or we don't have the, the space that we need. Now, months ago, we saw this coming, and so we began to pray, and we began looking for where and how God might be working in all this and what our next move should be. And to make a long story short, God opened a door for us to purchase the Adams Mill YMCA as a way to create more space here, but even more to create more spaces in other places so we can reach more people. Now, uh, if, again, if you've been around here, you've, you know some of these numbers, but I'm gonna go through them. But the total purchase and construction for the Adams Mill expansion is 18.3 million. But because of your gracious, generous giving, we've already put down 2.6 million towards the purchase price that brings the cost down to 15.7 million which is our capital campaign goal, $15.7 million. And Lord willing, that 15.7 will be uh, paid off through generous and sacrificial giving over the next three years in pledges. By the way, at the end of the service, uh, we're encouraging each family to pick up one of these brochures, multiplying our community to reach a community. And in it, you'll find uh, uh, all the details that you, need, that you need to know about what we're doing, uh, there's even drawings in there. We're not to that slide yet. <laughs> All the details, I'm talking more than I have in my notes, so uh, that's why we're off a little bit. But anyway, in here there's uh, drawings of the spaces, uh, what they're going to look like when we redo them. And at the back of it, now that slide, um, we'll, we'll, uh, we're encouraging you to pray and ask God 
what he would have you to give over a three-year period of time, three-year uh, pledges. All that's spelled out in the back of the book. I'm not gonna take time to do it today. We'll be talking about it in the weeks to come, and it is available online on the app. Yep, on the app. So we're praying that God would provide the resources needed to accomplish his, his work in us and through us, and that means that just like the elders have prayed and sought the Spirit's leadership about what God would have us do to create more space to care for and disciple the people he's bringing here, now we are asking you to pray and ask God what he would have you give to this work in order for Adam's Mill, the Adam's Mill opportunity to become a reality. We're asking you to ask God one simple prayer prayer, no pressure, this is between you and God, you just ask, Father, what would you have me do to partner with you in your work here at Fellowship Greenville? That's all we're asking you to play. Now, this is so encouraging. There have already been several hundred people praying this way already. Elders and staff and some people who have faithfully supported Fellowship Greenville over the years and between what's already been given and pledged, we've received $3.4 million in advance commitments. $3.4 million in advance commitments. I think that's worth a clap. Thank you. Thank you. And that brings the total down to $12.3 million. So do you see how God is already working in all this? And if you do, as Henry Blackaby says, when you see how God is working, that's your what? That's your invitation to join him there. So we're asking that you pray about that with us and join God in this good work. That's the what, that's the what that we've sensed the Spirit saying to us that has led us to where we are now. And let me just talk briefly about how we envision this working. The overarching commitment that we have in any expansion, but especially expanding to Adams Mill, is that Adams Mill will always have our fellowship DNA. In other words, what you experience here, you would experience there. That's our desire, that's our goal in everything that we do. So initially, we will do there exactly what we do here on Sunday mornings, and that means the worship there will be the same as here with live speakers and some video worked in, just like we do here on Sunday mornings. And Adams will, will run its own children's ministry and middle school ministry, just like we do here on Sunday morning. Over time, as Adams Mill grows, especially as it adds new people from the surrounding neighborhoods, we do see that it would uh, blossom into a full-fledged ministry offering all the ministries that we have here down there with elder and staff oversight, shepherding the needs of the congregation and making sure Fellowship Adams Mill remains tethered to us and our DNA. Ultimately, at some point down the road, when, say, the church has grown as many new people from the surrounding areas as those who left here to go there, and when, let's say, they're running two services and a full weekly program of ministry, we can see launching Fellowship Adams Mill out as a sister church, which would become an upstate church collective partner with us. But as we see it, that's a long way off. Now, if some of that seems foggy to you, join the club. I mean, here's the deal. We know what the Spirit is saying to us now, and we can sense the direction the Spirit is leading us now, but God hasn't given us the whole plan up front, which means we have to trust him and stay in step with the Spirit as he unfolds the future ahead. That's the how. Now that brings us to the why, and the why is much larger than the what of creating space or the how of multiplying ministry to other places. So the, for, rest, for the rest of the time, I wanna look at why I believe that God has graced us with growth like this and why he is trusting us with growth like this. And so I wanna talk about the why behind the what. Now, take your Bible and find your way to Luke chapter 15. Now, Luke chapter 15 is one of my favorite passages of Scripture, and I'll confess I have talked about this text and parts of this message before. I'm using it again because it makes a very important point, and that is 
uh, it's a point that we absolutely must remain focused on as we move forward into the future that God is preparing for us. Luke chapter 15 tells three different stories that make one point. But before we dig into those stories, I want to start with a story of my own. Now, this might sound strange, but when I first got in, uh, started in pastoral ministry about 40 years ago, and this was true of the first two churches I pastored, the first five years of pastoral ministry for me, this was true. And by the way, these churches that I'm talking about, I love those churches and I love the people in those churches. But there were times when I would talk to someone about Jesus, maybe it's someone with a little or no church background, but who were interested, curious about spiritual things. There were times like that when I found myself in kind of a predicament. The problem was I felt uncomfortable inviting them to church. And not just the church I attended, but the church I was pastoring. And to be the pastor of a church you don't feel comfortable bringing an unchurched person to, well, I think that's a little bit of a problem. Now, the problem was I knew that my church would be, feel very strange and weird to people like, uh, like that. And again, don't get me wrong, the people were really nice, good people, but the unchurched people, those nice people would be speaking a whole different language. Everything would feel very churchy and christian easy. Uh, it was like if the church was like a ladder, the first two churches I pastored had all the middle rungs and up, but none of the lower rungs. And many of the people that I talked to about Jesus needed some of those bottom rungs. Well, the only thing I could do was invite them to the church with me and Sadly, eventually, many of them would say something like, Charlie, I really like you, and, I, and honestly, I really like the people in this church, but I just don't feel like I fit in. Everything feels so foreign to me, and I heard this at least a half a dozen times over about a three-year period of time. They would say, I don't fit in, and Charlie, can we be honest with you? Can I be honest with you? We don't feel like you fit here either. I'm like, what do you do with that? I don't fit in the church I'm pastoring, according to this unchurched guy. Now, again, I like the church I attended, and if you'd have been in the church for more than 20 years or so, you would have liked it too. But if you were new to church, it was very, very hard to make the transition into a traditional church environment. And I begin to see then what I've seen ever since, and that is... There are a lot of people who are open to talking about God and life and faith, but it's church that puts them off. Maybe they grew up in a church and had a bad experience. Maybe they didn't grow up in a church of any kind. Oh, I, I, and, and that's right here in Greenville. A while back I was talking to a guy who said, I didn't go to church, my parents didn't go to church, my grandparents didn't go to church. And he, he's right here in Greenville. And in the world we live in today, you're hearing that kind of thing over and over and over again. Now, what's interesting about that is that when Jesus lived on this earth, unbelievers and unchurched people liked to be with him. Everywhere he went, the unchurched and unbelieving, those who used to believe, don't know what to believe, the confused, the broken, the disenchanted, the disenfranchised, however you want to describe them, those kind of people flock to hear Jesus teach. They like Jesus and they like being around Jesus. And as you read the Gospels, what's also interesting is that churchy people, religious people, didn't fit with Jesus. And Jesus didn't really fit with them either. So let me put it this way. As holy as Jesus was and as righteous as he was, people who were far from God liked being with him. They enjoyed being with him. And that being true, then you have to scratch your head, why is that the opposite in so many churches today. Why is it that today people who don't believe and used to believe and don't know what to believe, why is it that they don't want to have anything to do with the church? Now, we talked about this a couple of months ago, but if the church is supposed to be the body of Christ, how is it that we don't attract the people that Jesus attracted? See, the body of Christ means the closest you and I will ever get to Jesus' actual physical presence in the world today 
in some kind of way that you can touch and feel and hear and see, that's supposed to be the local church. The local church is supposed to reflect the physical presence of Jesus in our world today. So again, if the church is called to be the body of Christ, if we're supposed to be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus to people in our world today, if that's true, then why is it that so many unchurched people you and I rub shoulders with every day, they don't want anything to do with the church? Why is that? And how is it that over the years so many churches devolved into something that doesn't reflect Jesus to their neighbors. I believe it's because somewhere along the line, they lost their focus. They lost their focus. Maybe their focus turned inward and they focused on themselves, on the traditions and the styles they liked. Maybe their focus was all about maintaining the status quo or, doing and, or, or sticking with what comes comfortable, that's comfortable. Maybe their focus became fighting and criticizing other churches. Whatever it was, they lost their focus, and that's caused many of them to slide into the 85% of the churches in decline. And that's very discouraging to me. But let me tell you what's really encouraging to me, and that is I believe by God's grace, God has done and is doing something different here, something unique here, unique in the sense that with great intentionality, we have sought to create a church environment where people who don't believe and used to believe and don't know what to believe, they show up here and they feel welcomed and many of you feel like our church is a safe place to bring people to like that. Now, now don't, here, let me explain what I mean by unique. By unique, I don't mean better. I mean distinctive. Okay, so what makes us unique or distinctive? It's not just our music. As great as it is, I mean, there are other churches that do contemporary worship music. It's not just our teaching. There are a few other churches in the area that teach expositionally through books of the Bible. But it's not the teaching. The, the, the thing that makes us unique as a church is that we have great heartfelt worship and solid expositional Bible teaching, but at the same time, we have stayed committed to creating the kind of church where people who would never walk in the doors of a traditional church, they come here and they experience the presence of God and the grace of God, and they leave here saying things like, I don't know if I buy into all this or not, but when that guy taught the Bible, I could actually understand what he was saying. Or when I heard the music, it wasn't what I expected to hear in a church, but as I looked around at the people, I saw people smiling and singing and being moved by what was going on. And I've never been in a church where people actually wanted to go to church. <laughs> We've had that written in. And they say, I'll be back. By God's grace, we're a church like that because you are like that. You are like that. More than the preaching, more than the worship, more than anything else, the number one positive feedback we receive from new folks walking through the doors of our church is, is that Fellowship Greenville is genuine and that you are welcoming and caring and, and helpful. They brag on you. That's the number one thing. And that's the very thing I believe attracted unbelieving, unchurched, not very religious people to Jesus. Now, I'm sure at first they were, weren't so sure that they bought it into everything that Jesus was saying, but there was something so unique and so authentic and real about Jesus that even though they were sinners, Still, somehow, they were not put off by the fact that Jesus was a holy man. And, that he should, and, 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 and I think that should be the goal of every local church, to be Jesus in this way to people outside the church. Because when you read the Gospels, you see that Jesus was very intentional about seeking out unbelieving and unchurched people. That was his focus that's why he came, to seek and save people who were lost, people who didn't fit with the religion of their day, people who were ashamed of their pasts, people who tried hard to silence their guilty consciences, people who had pretty much given up on God because they figured that God had given up on them. Jesus focused on people like that. And I believe with all my heart that one of the biggest reasons that God has graced us 
with growth here is that for all the years since our inception, that's been the focus of Southside Baptist Fellowship Greenville. And as we move into the future that God is preparing for us, we have to continue to be intentional about maintaining that focus. Okay, let me give this scriptural foundation. Luke chapter 15, in this chapter, Jesus tells three short stories, the third one being the story of the prodigal son, which many of you are familiar with. But from these three stories, I'm gonna take out, I'm gonna mine out one big idea. One big idea. In these three stories, Jesus tells us the why behind the what of everything he said he did and, and did. The why behind the what of everything he said and did. And he reveals to us in these three stories the focus of everything he did in his earthly ministry. Now, first, you need to understand the audience here, Luke 15, 1. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. So get the scene in your mind. Here's Jesus surrounding by tax collectors, not IRS agents, but these were, in Jesus' day, tax collectors were hated because they were sold out their own people. They were considered traitors. They were, the, they were despised by everyone. Uh, they sold out to the Romans just to make a buck. And Jesus is surrounded by these kinds of traitors, and he's surrounded by sinners, and that is people who did not faithfully keep the law of Moses, people who were far from God, and they knew it. These were the people that religion wanted nothing to do with. The people, and these people didn't want anything to do with religion. And all these kind of folks were drawing near to hear Jesus speak. So I want you to think about this. Somehow, Jesus never compromised the truth of God's word, but at the same time, unchurched, unbelieving, broken, immoral people were drawn to him. And I want to be a Christian like that. I want us to be a church like that. I think it's what it means to be a community of grace and truth, passionately pursuing life and mission with Jesus. Now, there were other people in the crowd that day, the tax collectors and sinners, but they were good, upstanding, religious people who were there too, and they despised all these sinners who were coming to Jesus, verse two. And the Pharisees and scribes grumbled, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. You, you know what Jesus did when he's on this earth? If you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, don't miss this, because this might be why you're here this morning. You know what Jesus would do if he were here and he saw you here? He would welcome you. He would love you. He would want to hang out with you and go to lunch with you. He, he, he wouldn't hold your, your past or your present against you. He would want to know you. Because you see, the, the reason Jesus constantly ate with traitors and sinful, immoral people is because they were constantly inviting him into their homes to eat dinner with them. And even though they were nothing like him, they liked him. Somehow they didn't feel condemned by him, and that's what it meant to be in the presence of Jesus. And the Pharisees are grumbling about all this. They're going, why does this man who claims to be from God, why does he spend so much time with such ungodly people? He likes them, they like him. What is up with that? And to answer that question, Jesus tells three stories. Verse three, so he told them this parable. What man among you, having a hundred sheep, if he lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after that one that's lost until he finds it? Now, when he asked that question, all the men in the crowd would shake their head and go, yeah, that's right, that's right. If you got a hundred sheep and you lose one, you, you leave the 99 and you go look for that one that's lost, which illustrates a simple principle, and that is when something is lost to you, that lost thing becomes the focus of your attention, right? I mean, when you lose something, that thing becomes the focus of your attention. Not that you don't care about the other 99 sheep, of course you care about them, but the focus of your attention is on finding what's lost. How many of you go crazy when you lose your car keys? Yeah. How many of you lose your mind when you lose the remote? <laughs> Oh, you're just lying to me out here. There should be scores of hands going up. 
How about when you lose your phone? Oh, yeah, okay, now we got some hands going up, all right. So, yeah, even though you have another set of car keys in the drawer somewhere, even though you might have another remote that work in a bedroom that works in the living room or whatever, and even though, well, the phone is different, isn't it? But my point is, when you lose something that's valuable to you, it doesn't matter how much other stuff you have. The focus of your attention is that you are desperate to find that lost thing. How many of you have ever lost your passports? Hawkins, I tell you. When Karen and I were on our trip to Europe visiting missionaries, I lost our passports. I thought I was gonna have a heart attack and a mental breakdown all at the same time. But that's a story for another time. I hear you, well I thought our pastor was a man of faith. Well, I am a man of faith, but my faith was really tested. The good news is that we got him back just in time, which was truly a miracle, but that's a story for another time. Okay, but again, the point is, when you lose something that's valuable to you, it becomes the focus of your attention. And Jesus is saying, you wanna know why I'm spending all my time with tax collectors and sinners? It's because from God's perspective, they're lost. It's because it's just like a shepherd will chase down that one lost lamb that's gone astray. Jesus says, I've come into the world to seek and save those who, from the Father's perspective, are lost. He goes on in verse five and he says, and when the man, the shepherd finds that, that one lost lamb, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing, and he goes home and calls his friends and neighbors and says, rejoice with me, I found my sheep that was lost. And in the same way, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. He's saying, you wanna know what excites the heart of your heavenly father? You go looking for that one lost person who, who doesn't believe, who used to believe, who doesn't know what to believe, is too ashamed to believe, who is so confused and angry with God, they don't want to believe. Jesus says, you find a person like that, and when a person like that puts their faith in, the, in Christ, heaven throws a party. And he says, that's why I say and do all that I do because I'm focused on relating to and connecting with outsiders, with people who are far from God, with people who can't relate or connect with religious insiders. And now plus the fact he's saying I wanna keep the party going on. Now he tells a second story that's a lot like the first one but he talks to the women in the crowd which you just didn't do in that day. Verse eight, or what woman having sent 10 silver coins? Now, by the way, this was a part of her dowry. A father would give his daughter 10 coins and she would link them together into a headdress to show prospective husbands what they would get from the father if they were interested in her, the bride price, so to speak. And if she lost one of those coins, no way is she gonna go outside with a headdress of nine coins because it would be embarrassing to her and bring shame on her family, verse eight, or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she's found it, she calls together all of her friends and neighbors and says, come rejoice with me, I found the coin that I lost. And in the same way, I tell you, there's joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Same point. The focus of the woman's attention is not on the nine coins that she has, but on the one that she lost. And Jesus says, in the same way that a woman will search and search and search for her lost coin, in the same way your heavenly Father is on a search and rescue mission, and Jesus is saying, he sent me to lead that search and rescue mission. And Jesus says, is saying, I'm searching for the one, for the two, for all of those who are lost. And when the lost get found, oh man, heaven throws a party. Isn't that good? When the lost are found, heaven throws a party. That means every time somebody walks through these doors and hears the gospel of grace and turns from sin and turns from a religion of rules and rituals and trusts Christ alone by faith alone, it means that heaven throws a party. Every time one of our children, every time one of our students believes and is baptized, heaven throws a party. 
Every time someone from fellowship goes on a short-term mission trip to be the hands and feet and voice of Jesus somewhere in our community or in our country or goes to another country, every time you invest your time and money in missions or missionaries or mission agencies and someone trusts Christ for salvation through one of those search and rescue missions, heaven throws a party because what was lost is found. Don't you want to keep the party going? Now, in the first two stories, Jesus talked about things, sheep and shekels, things that were physically lost. Of course, clearly, verse 7 and 10, he's, when he says heaven throws a party for one sinner, he's talking about people. But it's not till we get to the third parable, the third story, that where he really defines exactly what lost means. Lost people are those who are relationally disconnected from their heavenly father. They are relationally disconnected from their heavenly father. And again, this becomes very clear in the third story. And for time's sake, I'm gonna summarize most of it because I'm just pulling out one big idea from all three stories. The third story is about a father and son. Son goes to his dad, and this is what he says. Dad, I wish you were dead. Verse 12, father, give me my share of the inheritance. He's saying, when you die, I'll get half your stuff, so I wish you'd just go ahead and die so I can get half my stuff now, which is so ungrateful and disrespectful. I mean, everyone in Jesus' audience, just like us, we'd be like, no, 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 he, he, he did not say that, did he? Yes, he did. And the father does a strange thing. He says, okay, son, we'll pretend like I'm dead. I'll go ahead and give you half of everything that's mine. Uh, that would one day be yours, just go ahead and take it now. It's yours. Now, can you imagine anybody you know telling you that story? Hey, Bob, you know, I've got a funny story here to tell you. Uh, my 17-year-old son came in last night, and he told me I wished, he wished I was dead, and he demanded I give him part of his inheritance now. And so I said, okay, son, here you go. Uh, 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 I mean, <laughs> I mean you, you want to sign this guy up for a parenting class, right? I mean, nobody does that. That's exactly what the father in Jesus' story does. So the son takes half the father's stuff, hits the road, goes to a city, buys himself a big condo, and starts hanging out with people who, uh, with, uh, who a bunch of friends who aren't really his friends, and he parties away all the money. His dad knows about it. His older brother knows about it. Whole family knows about it. Whole community knows about it. And they are shock rocked. But the boy's life doesn't play out like he hoped. There's a famine in the land, and he hits rock bottom. He ends up having to go work on a pig farm, and all the Jewish people in that audience are going, oh, man, that is so disgusting. And finally, the son comes to his senses, verse 17. He decides to go back to his father, and he puts together a little speech that goes something like this. Dad, I'm, I'm so sorry. I, I know I don't deserve to be your son, but if you would just let me be one of your hired servants, that's all I ask. Just let me work my way back into your favor. Verse 20, and he arose and came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. Again, the people, the men in the crowd are going, they're cringing, but filled with compassion, to have compassion on a son like this? The father ran and embraced him and blessed him and kissed him, and the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That confession was all he needed to experience, all he needed to experience God's grace, his father's grace. And the father said to his servant, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring that fat calf and let's kill it and let's have a barbecue and let's celebrate, let's party for my son was dead and now he's alive, he was lost, but now he's found and they began to celebrate. Now stop right there. If you are here this morning and you don't know where you stand with God, listen, this is God's posture towards you. He wants you to come back home. He's made all the arrangements for a huge party, a celebration just for you. And if you're disconnected from God, I want you to hear that you are the focus of God's attention, your heavenly Father's attention. You're the focus of your heavenly Father's affection. For a long time, he's been on a search and rescue mission for you. 
which is absolutely awesome. And Jesus said it plainly over in Luke chapter 19. He said, I've come to seek and save those who are lost, those who are disconnected, those who don't know what they believe, or even if they believe, I've come for them, Jesus says, and that means he's come for, for you. And if you come back to him, you won't find an angry God who has a list of all the bad things you've ever done to throw in your face. No, if you come home to God and you trust Christ for salvation, you'll find a loving father with his arms outstretched who says, I'm glad you're back. Let's not bring up the past. Let's have a party. Let's have a party. Yeah. That's God's grace. The story doesn't end there. It goes on to talk about the big party the fa father throws for his lost and found son. It goes on to talk about the angry older brother just like the angry religious leaders in the crowd that day and how the older brother resented his father lavishing all this love and attention on this no-account brother of his. And we see the father's compassion again as he pleads with the older son to come in and join the party. And the story ends with the father echoing the heart of the heavenly father, and he says, it's fitting for us to celebrate and be glad for your brother was dead and is alive, and he was lost, and now he's, he's found the end. We're left hanging. We're left hanging. We don't know what the older brother does. We don't know if he came in and joined the party. We're just left hanging, and Jesus left it that way on purpose. What purpose? Because in that day, as in our day, we have to decide if the Father's heart for the lost will be our heart for the lost. We have to decide if Jesus' focus will be our focus, if his search and rescue mission will be our search and rescue mission. The question is, will Jesus' focus of attention be our focus of attention? Or I should say, will Jesus' focus of attention continue to be our focus of attention? Because by God's grace, this church founded in 1946 this church, from its inception, has maintained this focus on reaching lost people, on reaching broken people who are far from God, people who don't believe, don't know what they believe, used to believe. I believe, and I believe that's why, as I said, God has graced us with growth. Because from the beginning, this church has kept its focus on leading people to a saving knowledge of Jesus, growing them up to be disciples of Jesus, and then sending them out on mission with Jesus which results in the whole cycle starting all over again. Walt Hanford was the pastor who was here for 32 years before I came. And this church, especially after Walt's grace awakening, uh, he began to make changes to be the kind of church that unchurched people would feel welcomed and loved and cared for. Not changes in doctrine or belief. That's never changed since 1946, but under Walt's leadership, this church, in the so to speak, reinvented itself to be more like Jesus in order to draw more people to Jesus. And Walt made hard choices. He made difficult changes. He changes that cost people their reputations and cost people relationships, changes that call people to make sacrifices, to build buildings and to move to new locations. Changes that created, these were changes, though, that created a church where lost, confused, broken, rule-bound people could experience the gospel of grace. And when I came here 27 years ago, I promised I would build on the grace foundation that Walt laid. And that's what we've been doing for all these years. And that's why we have grown. And that's why we have gone through name changes. And that's why we've gone through two building programs. And now a third one because we've continued to make Jesus' focus of attention on reaching the lost and discipling them and bringing them up in Christ, we've continued to hold that focus. And God is saying to us now, this building isn't big enough to do what I wanna do here. There are more people to reach, more people to disciple, more people to send out on mission. This past week also, I uh, heard a story that I think brings all this home for me. Um, there's these two guys, and they're in a coffee shop. 
a Starbucks somewhere in Texas. I know one of them personally. He's in full-time global mission ministry. He was meeting with this other guy who was going through Regen. And so uh, Jeff, the first guy, he uh, was his Regen mentor. And they were, talk, they were drinking coffee and they were talking about Jesus and they were talking about all the good things that they saw God doing in their lives. And evidently they talked for a good long while. And at some point a young woman walked up to their table and she didn't say anything. She just laid, it, laid a folded note on the table and this is what she said. She said, hi, I'm very shy and I don't mean to bother you I didn't intend to listen, but I couldn't help over here. Please keep doing your work for the broken. It must be hard and so much easier to focus on normal church people, but it's us who need you the most. The most broken people run from the church because we feel unaccepted. We feel how much work we are. We feel like burdens. We also feel like most people in the church want nothing to do with us because we might not live an ideal life. We may be strippers just trying to feed our kids and get through nursing school to give them a better life. We're hurting along with the whole world and sometimes though the TV and political Christians aren't what we think Jesus really wanted. We may have grown up in a church but felt pushed out when we had big questions that required perhaps uncomfortable answers and discussions. Please keep listening to the broken. They need you more than anyone. They need the church when they're on drugs. They need the church if they're gay. They need the church if they're homeless. They need the church if they're teen mothers. They need the church if they're prostitutes. And they need you. I'm sorry if this is weird. I have horrible anxiety, so I can't approach people with words. I can only write. Keep up the love, always. Always use love, because the broken have had enough hate. Just a broken mom trying to put it all back together. I am so grateful for you, because you're the kind of people who will love a woman like that if she was to walk through our door. You're the kind of people who welcome and love and care for broken people like that. The very kind of people that were attracted to Jesus and that's why I think that God has graced us with the opportunity to magnify his grace to Adamsville and other parts of the upstate and that's the reason that we gotta be careful to maintain our focus to seek and save those who are lost and that's exactly what multiplying our community to reach our community is all about. Creating more space here but even more creating more spaces in other places in order to continue to be a part of Jesus' rescue mission in the world and that's why we're asking you to pray pray and ask God what it means for you and your family to partner with him and with us in multiplying Jesus search and rescue mission to other parts of our community would you pray with me this is from day four in our 40 days of prayer Unchanging God, as we look ahead, we have confidence in your good plans for us. We know that you'll always work all things together for our good to make us more like Jesus. When we see your hand at work in exciting ways, may we rejoice and give you the glory. When challenges arise, help us to remind each other of your promises and encourage one another to not grow weary in doing good. And we anticipate seeing how you will make yourself known throughout this time of building Fellowship Greenville, Adams Mill. Thank you for your guidance as we walk with you into the future. Amen.